Welcome to the Harry Bridges School of Labor. Uh, tonight's class will be on the organizing of black workers during the formation of industrial unions. This is a very important topic for an, an event in history, a continuing event in history of trying to bring workers together because the division that is cultivated weakens us and finding ways to bring to highlight the struggles that both black white asian hispanic workers face um that they, they all they're all the same and that uniting together to fight them means that everyone can win is extremely important and so this presentation tonight is going to basically go over that theme of uniting together makes all of us stronger what we'll be learning tonight uh section one we'll take a look at the whole historical background of black workers in america and overviews of the organizing of black workers in the meatpacking industry and the sleeping car porters. Uh, our second section will focus on the organizing of black workers in the ILWU, most specifically uh, organizer for the ILWU, Franklin Jenkins. And the third section will uh, talk about the organizing and strike of the food, tobacco, agricultural, and allied workers, Local 22, in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, in... Uh, the 1940s. And this is section one, historical background of black workers in America and an overview of organizing black workers in meatpacking and sleeping car porters. Beginnings of African labor in North America. The North American colonies has supported themselves with the use of tobacco as one of the major early cash crops in colonial. Uh, this created a large demand for labor that was filled by the importation of both indentured persons and to a great extent African slaves, chiefly brought in uh, by the Southern planters. In colonial America, there was something called guilds that would eventually be displaced by the increasing cost of individual producers had to practice their craft independently in the competitiveness of social industry. A big weight on labor had been the slave for the carpenters, as, as an example, would be placed in competition for projects such as shipbuilding, caulking, mining, uh, but were mostly mainly plantation workers. The colonial, re the colonial regime began enshrining the status of Africans in Virginia with the case of John Punch in the 1640s, where he and two whites were apprehended trying to escape. They were subsequently punished with lifelong servitude, which led to legislation in places like New York that passed a law in 1703 establishing the death, death penalty for slaves as a consequence of running away from or, uh, or rebellion. New York became the epicenter of the slave trade with African American slave uh, African American uh, slave reaching uh, a staggering 43% of the population. One of the earliest law enforcement tools developed by the colonial government was a system of watchmen employed by a private citizen by private citizens. This would become the slave patrol under the control of the planters. As the 18th became the 19th century, the population of slaves would continue to expand under the condition of technical advancement in transportation and creation of mecha mechanical cotton. The free black population the year, years of slavery comprised of a mix of runaways, mixed race marriages, and individuals who had purchased their freedom. In certain areas, such as Spanish or French North America, as a result of colonial power plays, fill the manpower gap, Africans could be freed in exchange for military service. The American Revolution transformed 
the position of black population as a whole. Some states emancipated African Americans and others granted property owners the right uh, to vote, such as Massachusetts in 1780. Uh, ordinances secured the states of the territories north of the Ohio River as free states. Since the end of the Civil War, the bosses have always cultivated race hatred in blacks and uh, and white workers. Many industries were entirely closed to black workers, such as steel, auto, rubber, textile, lumber, electrical, etc. However, some were allowed into these industries if they agreed to be scabs when white workers would strike. Even many unions who had conservative leadership would enact their own racial uh, discrimination to the detriment of all workers since this hostility led to many black leaders dis uh, disregarding unions as a way to improve the lot of black workers. Kelly Miller, a black professor at Harvard uh, Dealing, uh, dealing with black workers and trade unionism, said, whatever good or evil the future may hold for him, Today's wisdom, needless of logical consistency, demands that stand shoulder to shoulder with the captains of industry. Frustrated with the realities of discrimination on and off the job, under the Crow, under Jim Crow, many Black workers came together to form the Universal Negro Improvement Association led by Marcus Garvey in 1917. This military, militant organization was one of the first which took up the plight of black workers here. The UNIA fought exclusively uh, from trade unions, uh, pro a deprivation of land taxation without representation and just military service. Jim Crow laws, and lynching. At the height, it had nearly 500,000 members, making, up, making it the largest political organization for black workers at the time. However, it was slowly declining due to a lack of class orientation uh, uh, culminating in its uh, advance, uh, advancing stock trading during the prosperity years of President Coolidge and the entire organization uh, folding in 1925 after Garvey was arrested for defrauding the UNIA of $500,000. At the same time, the UNIA took the first steps. William Z. Foster and J.W. Johnstone led the biggest organization drive of black workers in U.S. labor history in the meatpacking plants which had become enormous due to World War I. Since the early 20th century, the meatpacking industry remained unorganized and was deemed by the AFL to be an organizer. On the basis of forming the Federation of the Small Craft Unions within the industry, Foster and Johnstone employed a militant organiz organizing and strike policy in July of 1917. Once a significant portion of the industry had become organized, a national strike was launched and ended successfully in March of 1918 and an uh, arbitration agreement granting wage increases, the eight-hour day, and union recognition, among other improvements. The organizing campaign success meant that the Chicago Federation of Labor now had the world, world over had the largest body of black workers, I don't know where I got that from, uh, anywhere in the world. Over 20,000 black workers out of 200,000 organized nationally were brought into unions during the campaign. Important strides were made in fighting the idea that unions were bad for black workers, which was purposely cultivated by the boss bosses a success which was built upon by Tool, 
in early 1920s to full, fully re or re realize the true uh, truth that black workers did not have to fight alone. And what we have here is a old headline. I didn't, uh, when trying to find this, I couldn't find the date or the paper it actually came from. Uh, but this is a headline from an article attacking uh, the organizing committee of the packing house workers for have electing black leadership at the time. Okay. The Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, BSCP, was founded on August 25th. 1925 in New York City. The union was the first predominantly African-American labor union in the country and represented porters for Pullman rail cars. Civil rights leader A. Phil Randolph was chosen to be the leader of the BSCP because he is not employed by the Pullman company. Unionizing would not cost him his job. Randolph was known for being an advocate for workers' rights and edited a socialist magazine, The Messenger. When he used to raise awareness of the labor movement, this marked the beginning of a 12-year struggle for dignity, better working conditions, and, the fair, and fair pay. Their eventual triumph marked the first time in American history that a black union forced a powerful corporation to the negotiation table. It was a significant step towards a black equality for black equality. The BSCP fa faced resistance from both the Pullman Company and the black leaders who viewed the Pullman Company positively for hiring black workers. The BSCP also faced resistance from the American Federation of Labor, who was unwilling to uh, charter the BSCP as an in international charter. Workers who regularly fi uh, fired for the involvement in union activity, the federal government, the government denied the union's demand for recognition. The, the main demands of the BSCP were 240-hour basic month, pay for uh, preparatory time and delays, shorter runs, more sleep on the road, decreased work expenses, control of doubling out, a living wage, and independent union recognized by the Pullman Company. A key part of the fight was the Colonial Women's Economic Council, founded by the wives of Pullman uh, porters. The auxiliary group raised money for the effort and organized letter writing uh, campaigns that supported for uh, for the effort and organize uh, uh, labor friendly legislation. They often held their meetings when their husbands were out on the road and could not be. Uh, suspected of organizing. Mick Watt wrote, A favorable turn in the political climate brought about by the New Deal, combined with the uh, persistence of union leaders and the membership, finally forced the company to recognize the BSCP in 1935. The AFL granted the BSCP an international charter that some years and after Protracted negotiations, the union won its first contract in 1937. And with that, we'll break for the first round of questions and comments. Hey, um, I actually really enjoying this class and I'm interested in learning a lot more because I need to know the struggle of all workers in this country for fighting for a better everything, better living standards, better pay, pay, and, you know, winning. I love hearing these stories of winning. Thank you. It's not clear to me what the impetus was that turned the Black workers around to organize. I mean, it's almost like it was, what do you call it? Uh, uh, it came out of the blue. 
Um, you know, I mean, you, you talk about McGarvey, but was it McGarvey that started the ball rolling or not? But I mean, it's absolutely amazing that they turned around 180 degrees and really, um, really did a great job of organizing and then had that much influence. Yes, it took 10 years, but still, um, I don't, I don't understand what the, what happened. Yeah, well, it caused a lot of black workers to not, I mean, there was always an interest to unionize, but they were prevented from doing so um, for a couple of reasons, like mentioned in, in the PowerPoint, uh, conservative leader, leadership within the unions discriminated against black workers, excluded them from trade union membership. Um, by some accounts, really the only way for some black workers to even get into some industries was uh, for them to be a scab. Um, the discrimination from the unions was so prevalent, but what turned it around was class oriented trade unionists fighting against that type of leadership within the unions and uh, pushing for the uh, organization of uh, black workers because they were, it was in the interest of, of all workers. Uh, one, to eliminate the source of scabs, um, and then also to combine forces to form an even bigger uh, union so that the union had more power. And so it took a lot of time. It took a lot of um, organizing on the part of class-oriented trade unionists to uh, push it through. Um, and of course, it was not without resistance from the AFL, which fought every step of the way um, in doing it. I just want to add one quick thing. We can't forget the role that predece our predecessor organizations such as the Trade Union Education League and the Trade Union Unity League played in bringing these workers together. Uh, uh, what, 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 um, what happened to the Pullman's Union? Is it still around? They merged, uh, into what is now the Transportation Communication uh, Union, which is part of the International Association of Machinists, and they were one of the unions that was involved in the the Ralph struggle a couple of years ago. Um, but yeah, through merges through. Um, you know, as the workers on the railroads lessened, they had to merge unions in order to stay afloat. So I, I, the current iteration of them is the, the, the Transportation Communication Union. And they're regularly in a bargaining unit with the, the Transport Workers Union when they bargain in with the railroads. Um, How did they convince or try to convince black people that unions were not good for them like specifically like any yeah but it was basically just the discrimination that was practiced that really made the um idea of a union something that black leaders in particular the black intelligentsia of would say is not something for black workers. Like the quote said in, in the presentation that their interest really lies with the capitalists. The fact the American Federation of Labor was uh, against organizing black workers and they were segregation, segregationist in their own right did not help the situation. And with that, we're gonna go to our second uh, section on Frank Jenkins and the ILWU. So Frank Jenkins was born in 1902 in Monterey, California, which is now Fort Ord. He grew up on military bases in the United States and Philippines. His father was an army man. He was raised as a military brat with understanding of what duty and discipline means. Um, and he didn't like being in the limelight and always stayed humble. 
Um, he was also a dedicated family man, and he would refuse to work weekends so that he could spend it with his um, with his son and his family. Um, but he was also a charismatic and skilled speaker who would invent words such as whitelisting and uh, fistic ability. When um, he made up whitelisting, that's, he said, it's the same thing as blacklisting. Uh, just a little context. Um, so he started working as a longshoreman in 1918 um, and dropped out of high school in his sophomore year um, against his parents' wishes. His parents wanted him to go to school and get a degree, um, but he joined the longshoreman anyway. Because he started at such a young age, his knowledge of the longshoreman trade was second nature or even like encyclopedic. Um, a lot of the agreements and sort of logistics between the different ports on the West Coast was a very detail oriented endeavor and he knew it very well. He also recalled working with <clears throat> Mexicans African Americans and Scandinavians, as well as other white ethnics, during his first summer in the trade. He called the longshoremen a, quote, different breed of animal, unquote, and a group of men who, quote, will not accept what they think is not fair. Um, and he said that they lived on the premise that the union is controlled by the rank and file. Um, Jenkins, uh, as a black man, did face racial discrimination, but he considered it something of a minor setback and not um, a permanent defeat. Um, and he, um, I think he would provide him or he would pride himself on resorting to quote unquote sub subterfuge to overcome these barriers. Um, the hiring halls at the time would engage in favoritism, um, which would result in less steady work for blacks. Um, and these were hiring halls that were run by the company at the time, not union uh, hiring halls. But Frank Jenkins saw labor unions as as important uh, advocates for civil rights. And at one point in time, Harry Bridges um, said that um, he considered uh, Jenkins to be a civil rights man to the likes of MLK. Um, during World War II, he did try to join the army to be like his father. Um, but when he went to the recruiting office for the army, um, he had a sort of a big back and forth between the recruiting officer there saying like, oh, you, you don't have enough experience. And he'd be like, I'm the most experienced in my trade, like that you'll find anywhere around. Um, and eventually he got the guy to admit, he said, um, to say, you know, what's like the sergeant, uh, the recruiting officer said, like, you know why we won't accept you. And then Jenkins said, my color is against me. And then the sergeant said, yeah, that's right. So after he couldn't get in the army, he tried joining the Navy and the, um, I'm sorry, it, uh, the recruiting officer there said, um, 
by union recruiting officer, they were trying to recruit within the Longshoreman Union itself, but the recruiting officer said him straight to his face that there's no place for him because he didn't have the right ethnic background. And later in the 50s, um, Jenkins had a Coast Guard pass as a longshoreman, but it was taken from him after he testified at Harry Bridges' trial, um, and he was accused of being a communist. And he felt a connection with Harry Bridges because those were the same accusations that Harry Bridges was under trial for in the first place. Of course, this is all during the Red Scare and the McCarthy era. Um, so that's the context. Um, he did admit that there were communists in the uh, ILWU, but he defended them and their right to coexist with other political parties like the Democrats and the Republicans. It was like they were just another political party. Um, so he kind of had uh, it. It said that um, he offered bitter descriptions of joining the military for the rest of his life. So even though his dad was an army man and he grew up an army brat, he didn't think very highly of the military for most of his life. So then in the strike of 1934, unions across the West Coast called for a quote, single coastwide contract creation of a union controlled hiring hall a dollar per hour straight time, the six hour day, and the 30 hour week, unquote. After the negotiations broke down, all West Coast ILA locals went on strike on May 9th, 1934. 12,000 black and white workers struck together, including other unions in Seattle, such as the seamen, Mar uh, marine firemen, uh, masters, mates, pilots, and the marine cooks and stewards. The strike was so large and prolonged that by June, the strike had begun to impact residents of Alaska. Um, but um, that harming the public was not the intention of the strike, nor should it ever be. Um, so but they use that as an opportunity to make um, an agreement which that was called the alaska agreement which allowed union labor to be able to work on the ships going to alaska and then the alaska T steam uh, ship operators company from then on vowed to only hire ila workers as a show of gratitude um, because of the strike, um, the hiring halls would now all be union run. And um, while union and non-union workers would utilize them, they would all have to um, use the same fee. And then following the strike, the ILA gave Black activists important institutional power to enact racial justice as a class issue and not just a civil rights issue huh. and then um jenkins said that waterfront employers after the strike treated everyone fair and square regardless of race and with that we'll break for our uh, next round of questions and comments i just would like to make one point uh we went from discussing we mentioned the ilwu and then went to the ila uh, before 1937, the West Coast uh, longshore workers, all, the, the whole West Coast, were also members of the International Longshoremen Association, the ILA. Uh, everything mentioned as the ILA did was essentially the IL, what would become the ILWU. <clears throat> the ILA still is the East Coast Port, still runs the East, is a union representing the East Coast Port workers, a very reactionary union and has... The ILA itself was kicked out of the AFL-CIO for its uh, corruption and connection to the, um, to the mob. So a very 
Big difference between the East Coast and the West Coast Longshore Unions. So I'm going to make sure that point is clear. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say that to put their demands in context, $1 an hour in 1934 would be equivalent to about twenty-two seventy-four an hour in 2024. You just said the ILA was kicked out of the AFL-CIO because of mob connections. Is that why the ILWU uh, first split off in 37, or is there something else? Oh well, the whole, uh, the whole 1934 strike and its aftermath is what led to the ILWU to break away. In the long run, the ILA essentially functioned at that time on the West Coast as a company union. Uh, and throughout the strike of 1934, uh, the ILA essentially tried to crush the union at every turn. Uh, that strike, uh, was across the entire West Coast. And it led to in San Francisco and to be to a general strike in the city of San Francisco. Uh, and at every turn, the the national leadership of the IL, all well, the international leadership of the ILA, I uh, was trying to break the will of the strikers and the situation between the West Coast workers and the ILA got to the point where uh, once the CIO was formed, they broke away and formed the International Longshore and Warehouse Union. Uh, the ILWU went and affiliated with the CIO in 1937. If there's no more uh, questions or comments, we're going to go on to our next section. Section three, the organizing and strike of the Food, Tobacco, Agricultural, Cultural, and Allied Workers Union, Local 22. Organizing Local 22. Local 22 of the Food, Tobacco, Agricultural, and Allied Workers was a short-lived union at R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Plant in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Primarily organized by Black women in the Jim Crow South, the story of Local 22 is the embodiment of the slogan, Black and White, Unite and Fight. The seeds of what would become Local 22 were planted in winter 1942, when the United Cannery, Agricultural, Packing, and Allied Workers of America, or the UCAPAWA, sent organizer Franklin Darns to Winston-Salem, North Carolina, with a few copies of the UCAPAWA news to distribute for the purpose to, be quote, begin building the base for a labor organization. Soon enough, interest among workers was built to the point where an office was rented and a Tobacco Workers Organizing Committee was formed. Soon after, Franklin Darns was drafted into the war, but the UCAPAWA replaced him with two experienced organizers, Harry Coger and William DeBerry, who sought, who sought to gain support from the black churches in Winston-Salem due to their deep connections in, in the city. A core team of rank-and-file organizers was put together. They were motivated to join the campaign for the union's goals of higher wages, better working conditions, and equal rights, and even by a long-standing indignation at injustices of, injustices of Southern society, including the repression of textile workers in Gastonia. And that was a major strike that took place in the late 1920s, and was a spearhead in industrial union organizing. These rank and file leaders represented a generation of articulate, aspiring, and relatively well-educated black workers. Most had come of age in the early 1930s. Segregation, discrimination, and depression had combined to limit their prospects severely. But the stirring rhetoric if not always the actual policies of the New Deal, what are their appetites for greater social and economic opportunities? Denied jobs commensurate with their training, intelligence, and ability, they sought ways to challenge the restrictions of Jim Crow. Organizers spent hours knocking on doors and distributing leaflets around the plants. The organizers sent by UCAPAWA became familiar figures to thousands of R.J. Reynolds employees 
as they stood at the factory gates daily, handing out literature for the campaign. One rank and file organizer, Robert Black, this is a quote on him from the early stages of the campaign, quote, we began to have discussions on Sunday afternoons after church. The organizers would instruct us how you go about building a union. DeBerry would sit in the meetings with us and we would always have broad discussions about how unions were built, how they, oper how they were operated. It was a slow process, but we never gave up the idea of building a union. And the company's executives would read it and laugh about it because they didn't see how we were ever going to get the workers together to build a union. False confidence of management allowed black workers room to maneuver. The NLRB's reinstatement of Ruel White, a local tobacco workers international union or TWIU, which was an AFL affiliate, a uh, leader who had been fired during an earlier organizing campaign may have made officials cautious about interfering with union activity. But this hands-off policy by management and the workers' determination created a space where ideas and organization could develop. The regular workers' meetings with UCA PAWA organizers served as an educational opportunity for both workers and organizers. Organizers passed on the knowledge and experience they had gained in the labor movement. Workers then taught the organizers about life on the shop floor and in Winston-Salem. The meetings mixed practical training with discussion of labor's role in American history and worker struggles in other industries. Darns, DeBerry, and Koger also offered a critique of capitalism and white supremacy that combined a class-oriented trade unionist message with the prophetic vision of the Bible. This critique had an enormous appeal because it resonated with black workers' culture and experience, and even as it elevated the collective efforts of Winston-Salem workers to national and international significance. The organizers sent by the UCAPAWA believed in rank and file organizing. They helped provide a framework and resources for the workers to use, as well as acted as facilitators. But the core work of convincing the workers was a duty of the rank and file organizers being developed in these meetings. These rank and file organizers formed a, a volunteer service club to, to sponsor quote unquote cottage meetings, arrange entertainment for union gatherings, and staff the union hall. What these Carter's meetings were would be one of the organizers or occasionally one of the more experienced recruits would go to someone's home to talk about the union with a few workers invited by the host. Secrecy was an advantage of this strategy. The ability to have frank, in-depth discussions with a group of workers was another. And to connect that to modern times, when you read stories with the uh, about the organizing of JFK here with the Amazon Labor Union, they use a similar tactic where they would meet at people's homes to organize. This way they would do it outside of the purview of Amazon. Person-to-person uh, -person contacts combined with cottage meetings and occasional gatherings of larger groups in churches or fraternal halls proved to be the most effective method of recruitment in the long months leading up to the R.J. Reynolds walkout. The TWOC was active in more than just organizing the workers. They were involved in the struggles within the greater community. They conducted well-publicized -pub war bond drives. Members helped elderly citizens file claims for old age assistance and consulted with government officials to ensure that the claimants received adequate relief. The TWOC was also involved in the case of William Mason Wellman, who was a black man falsely accused of raping a white woman. They ultimately got him pardoned. In January 1943, CIO, CIO organizer Frank Hargrove took over as chairman of the TWOC. A key goal at this time was to organize union-minded white workers to build a black and white coalition of workers to bring the fight to R.J. Reynolds. 
At this time, black and white CWOC members met separately during the organizing campaign. But Hargrove reported regularly to the Volunteer Service Committee and his contacts with uh, some of these white organizers, Clark Shepard, Crawford Shelton, and, and others. In May, on May 30th, the TWOC held its largest meeting to date, and this was an inter interracial victory rally at the Mount Calvary Holiness Church. The UCAP AWA Vice President, Owen Whitfield, spoke to more than 350 workers about the need to maintain interracial unity in the war against fascism, fascism and stress the vital role of the CIO played in making the four freedoms, freedom of speech, freedom of worship, freedom from want, and freedom from fear, a reality for black workers. And now we had the June 1943 sit-down strike. Uh, the organizing drive came to a boiling point on June 17th, 1943, when 200 women in plant number 65, led by TWOC organizer Theod Theodosia Simpson, stopped work striking the mash that started the flame. Angered by the mistreatment of one of their colleagues earlier that day, they returned to the factory floor after lunch and refused to continue working. And I'm going to show a short video clip from uh, the TikTok of um, the Southern Workers or um, the Southern Service Workers uh, Union. Uh, and just. this day in Southern labor history. In Winston-Salem, North Carolina, black workers in the tobacco industry took a bold step toward workplace democracy that we can still learn from today. After enduring dangerous working conditions and poverty wages, they formed the United Tobacco Workers Local 22 of the Food, Tobacco, Agricultural, and Allied Workers of America. Their movement united black and white workers with a multiracial alliance from the larger Winston-Salem community. Organizing in North Carolina's tobacco industry started on June 17, 1943, with a sit-down strike at the R.J. Reynolds Company. The sit-down strike and actions that would occur after, primarily organized and led by black women who processed the tobacco, were instrumental in winning the workers' better conditions and wages. The coalition that tobacco workers brought together created a multiracial movement of unionists and civil rights activists fighting not only for the rights of working people, but also for the rights of black people. Despite their ultimate defeat, the spirit of the multiracial working class coalition formed by the local 22 tobacco workers in Winston-Salem reminds us of the power we have when we organize across social and economic divides. In this day in Southern labor history, their coverage proved infectious prompting a group of male workers in a neighboring room to join in almost immediately. One of these men, 38-year-old James McArdle, stepped forward and declared a solidarity with the women strikers. Moments later, he fell to the floor dead of a cerebral hemorrhage. The explosive mix of the work stoppage and McArdle's sudden death, which due to R.J. Reynolds' culture of pushing employees to their physical limits, caused long simmering resentment to boil over. News of the strike spread quickly throughout the company's plants. Within days, the workers had pulled off the unthinkable. They had shut down the operations of one of America's industrial giants and found themselves sitting across the table from Reynolds executives, demanding changes during a strike that lasted six days. The workers went back to work after six days during which negotiations took place. Worker representatives gave their grievances on wages, working conditions, and other issues. R.J. Reynolds made some minor concessions on working conditions, but the fight wasn't over. After the negotiation ended with little more than a moral victory for the workers, the TWOC demanded a union election. And in came the AFL's Tobacco Workers International Union with jurisdictional claims, and they were added to the election with the workers divided into two bargaining units. Unit 1 represented pre-production workers, and Unit 2 represented manufacturing workers. And this was done on purpose by the AFL uh, Union because Unit 1 was mostly the black workers, and Unit 2 was mostly the white workers. 
In typical AFL fashion, the TWIU ran a racially motivated campaign trying to divide the workers. TWOC had won Unit 1 elections, while it narrowly lost the Unit 2 elections to a no-union vote. All sides contested the election, and the NLRB nullified both elections, leaving the workers in the same position they were in before. And I just want to note that there was thousands of workers that worked in these different, in both these bargaining units, and the, the TWIU was only able to account for less than 400 votes among thousands of workers, thousands of workers between the two bargaining units. After months of legal fights, new elections with the entire plant as one single bargaining, bargaining unit took place in December 1943. Two-thirds of the workers voted for the TWOC as their union representation. Local 22 is formed. Uh, now the UCAPAWA uh, changed their name to the United Tobacco, uh, the United Food, Tobacco, and Agricultural and Allied Workers Unions in 1944. In April 1944, the first contract was agreed to at R.J. Reynolds. Included in the agreement were reinstatement of 18 wrongfully terminated workers, the enactment of a seniority system, one-year leave of absence for a woman wishing to have a child while maintaining her seniority, letter from a doctor overruled medical department on sickness, and a four-step grievance system. And on the issues they couldn't agreement at that time, due to it being at the height of World War II, the National War Labor Board, as opposed to the National Labor Relations Board, would decide the issues they couldn't agree on, including such key issues as wages, union security, dues checkoff, vacations, and top seniority for shop stewards. And with that, we'll break for our last round of questions and comments. Yeah, um, this ends to 1944 can you give us a quick update on what it looks like now after uh their hard work needless to say uh well uh unfortunately local 22 uh dissolved under pre under uh mccarthy a pressure during the, the red scare period uh and uh they didn't last that they, they only lasted as a local Less than ten years, unfortunately. Uh, but you know what they did and the role they played uh, lives on because the what they were able to accomplish in the Jim Crow South uh, at that time was something even today a, a lot of unions can't accomplish. Well, wow. uh, yeah, I think this was very informative. I don't know very much about the history of Black workers organizing in the U.S. Um, so this was really great. Yeah, I, I definitely didn't think about unions discriminating against Black workers at first and all the problems that would cause. And I'm really um, proud of people for overcoming those obstacles. Yeah, yeah that, that's a major, major thing. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, a lot of people today still uh, hold as if the old AFL hierarchy is what's still running. I mean, there's there's a lot of similarities with the craft union mentality and business unionism, uh, but a lot of people will, will hold that uh, backwardness of the craft unions of the old AFL and act as if the, the labor movement as a whole has been nothing but discriminatory to black workers, and it's just simply not true. Uh, with the, With the organizing of, indu of industrial unions and that could have only been successful if with all with uniting all workers no matter whether they were black hispanic asian white no matter what because without organizing everybody you can't have an industrial union and you will ultimately fail uh we have i have a, a comment in the chat here if they were able to accomplish this much during jim crow Makes me think why it's so hard to do anything nowadays. But we got the mob and undercovers sticking their dirty fingers in most unions now. Well, we had a lot of undercovers then, too. And there might have been some mob, mob involvement then. Uh, that ties and go 
go back a long way, but a lot of it is, you know, the McCarthy gay purges, purged most of the class oriented trade unionists in the forties. And the labor movement's been suffering since, and it's been a long fight to get back to it. Uh, but if I say something on that, the struggles with UAW give us a glimmer of hope that there's a new future coming. And it, but without us there to help lead it, 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 it will not happen. Yeah, I was kind of wondering about um, sharecroppers during this time. Um, they were kind of like tenant farmers. Were there any sort of like organizations that they form to sort of like stand up for their rights or was that um heavily oppressed i i don't know uh a lot about um uh like 1930s uh or 20s organizations but i do know uh that uh one of the expressions um uh that uh uh, the struggle of um, uh, uh, the sharecroppers took was a, a political formation called uh, the Populist Party. Yes, uh, there was the sharecroppers union that was organized between 1931 and 1936. They faced a lot of repression in the Deep South. Um, there is a good book written on that, Hammer and Hoe. Uh, and... It was a long, it was a, a fight, uh, to say the least. But yeah, there was organizing sharecroppers. Mm -hmm. Okay, with that, we're going to close out. All right. The Harry Bridges School of Labor is presented by the Labor United Educational League. And you can find us on various social media platforms. You can find us on Twitter or X at Lul underscore UX. On Instagram at Lul dot US on Facebook at laborunited.lul. And we now have a YouTube channel at Labor United. And you can find, as of right now, all of our classes from last year have been uploaded to our YouTube and you can find them all there. Uh, and we're pretty close to being basically up to date when our class is there. We'll probably be about a month or two behind with classes for going forward. So we're pretty, doing good there. And you can find our website for the organization at lul.us and our publication Labor Today at labortoday.lul.us. Mm -hmm. Next month's uh, session for the Harry Bridges School of Labor will be a viewing of Norma Ray with a discussion on the real life Norma Ray, Crystal Lee Sutton. And that, that session will be presented by our partner organization, Women, Women for Racial and Economic Equality, or Ray. And with that, we're going to have our closeout song. Uh, this song is a love songs melody. And it's from uh, a play, Love Songs from the Liberation Wars, which is actually uh, a play that was done a few years ago on the fight of Local 22. And this, this is sung by the uh, DC uh, Labor Council Chorus. <laughs>